right, it's my pleasure to introduce the second speaker of today. It's Claudia Diaz from K11. And so we've just heard about how they're going after the people and doing something on tour. So now we see one of the tags on defenses, namely website fingerprinting on tour. Thank you, Tanya. This works? Yeah. So the work I'm presenting uh, here has been done uh, jointly with uh, a number of colleagues. Um, it's, has been, part of it has been already published in CCS last year, and part of it is still in, in progress and will be submitted at some point in the near future. Uh, of the authors, I want to point out Mark Juarez, who is uh, sitting back there and is the lead author of, uh, of both works. All right, so... Uh, one of the things, uh, I mean, we already knew, but it's very clear from the Snowden documents, is that the NSA surveillance is not just about cryptanalysis and analyzing communications con contents. It's of obviously about signals intelligence, meaning the analysis of metadata, which includes uh, information such as the time of a communication, duration, the identities of the people communicating, locations from which they communicate, and any characteristics about the pattern of communication that are not like, directly re related to the, the content that is being exchanged. Uh, this metadata is exposed by default in uh, secure communication protocols that we use uh, in the Internet. And that makes uh, bulk collection uh, very easy because the information is just available. It is not in volume quite as much as uh, collecting all the content. Um, and it is also uh, easier to analyze because it's in machine-readable formats um, and as well, very not only cheap to analyze, but also highly valuable in the sense that it can be very revealing of uh, structures of organizations, for example, the social network within an organization, or intentions uh, of, um, of people who are planning something and they will be communicating beforehand and so on. Uh, as well, it's not only uh, from a technical point of view, but also legally, metadata has a, a much lower level of protection than, than content of communications. So that means that it's also uh, possible to lawfully on, obtain um, of this data with uh, much lower uh, thresholds. So we do have some systems that are dedicated to the protection of metadata, and uh, one of them is the, the Tor network, which, uh, according to the NSA, is the, the best uh, system available. Uh, and they even had a program called Ecotistical Giraffe that uh, explained, uh, well, was trying to, to break into the Tor network using different uh, techniques. So I'm assuming most people here, everyone knows how the Tor network works. If, is there anyone who doesn't know how Tor works? Okay, good. I don't have to explain how Tor works, great. So uh, how does finger, what, sorry, finger printer work? So the idea is that we have um, a, um, a user of uh, the Tor network and we want to know, the adversary wants to know which websites this user is browsing when he's, uh, when he's using the Tor browser or the Tor network for web browsing. Um, here. Sorry. So uh, the idea is that the adversary can also use the Tor browser. So what, the, what he will do is to use this, uh, this available network to uh, crawl uh, a number of websites, uh, maybe just the websites of interest, maybe a larger set, uh, including websites of interest and others who are maybe not so interesting for the adversary. Uh, and the idea is that the adversary builds a database of traces of how these websites look like when you download them over Tor and how they look like in terms of packet lengths, in terms of, uh, of sorry, of, uh, yes, uh, number of packets per second, in terms of uh, total size, in terms of any traffic characteristics that do not involve looking into the communications because the communications are encrypted and therefore protected. Uh, once the adversary has built this database, the next step is to observe users, observe the traffic when they are using the Tor network, and then try to figure out from that traffic, matching it to the database of templates that was built beforehand, trying to figure out which website the user is browsing. Okay? So why are these attacks important? Well, um, one of the reasons is that in the Tor network, uh, defending against adversaries like the, that, that can actually simultaneously observe both ends of communication becomes very hard. Uh, there are things that are very difficult to conceal if you don't, are, without, a, a very huge, without a huge usability penalty, for example, the start of the time of communication. If, you if you're looking at both ends, you see a communication start on one end, and you see a communication start 
exiting at the other end at the same time, then well, with a, a delay that is predictable within what you expect to see the delay between the two ends, then it becomes very difficult to defend against that attack. That's a very powerful adversary, observing but at the same time input and output. It's hard to, to without huge cost, it's hard to defend against that. But the website fingerprinting adversary is much weaker than that. It's an adversary that only observes the, 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 the user communication. It's somewhere in between the user and the Tor network. So this could be anyone from uh, somebody who has access to your Wi-Fi router. It could be your ISP. It could be any intermediary in your local network, basically, who can observe your, your communication. And this, this uh, adversary doesn't see anything of what's happening at the other side when your communications exit. So this is a weak adversary that the Tor network actually aims to protect against. Um, and therefore, uh, it's important to, to make sure that such a local adversary cannot recover information such as uh, web browsing information that is highly sensitive and that is what is precisely meant to, to be protected uh, by the Tor network. And there have been a number of successful attacks. Uh, website fingerprinting has, uh, it was first, um, they were the, the early publications on website fingerprinting are from the early 2000s, but we have seen in later, in later years uh, that uh, many new papers are coming up looking at uh, new algorithms on uh, how to perform website fingerprinting, trying to propose defenses on, uh, to protect against this attack. Uh, and yeah, we, we see that it's a field that by itself already has about 30 publications in the, in the last years. One thing we can also see is that in the, early, the earlier works, we did not focus on Tor, but just on, uh, on encrypted communication, so HTTPS uh, browsing. Um, it's a slightly different problem there, uh, and I will mention, uh, I think, later some of that in the sense that in Tor you really don't know what the end um, of the communication is in terms of it could be anywhere in the web. When you have a non-Tor um, setup in which it's just a website that uses HTTPS, uh, there you, you typically have a, a limited universe of pages within that site, and you might want to know, to learn which of the pages within the site the user is downloading. So it's a slightly uh, easier uh, problem. So, uh, okay, lots of works on website fingerprinting. Uh, and um, um, in this, uh, when you're performing these attacks, I mean, you have to make a number of assumptions, and these assumptions are typically made in the, in the website fingerprinting literature. So assumptions include client settings. So uh, since the adversary has to beforehand prefetch all these uh, web pages and build templates for them, uh, and then later on we'll apply this uh, to uh, find out what the, the user is doing. There is the, the assumption of, okay, um, what happens if, they are, if the user is, is browsing the web in different ways than how the adversary imagined this user to browse the web? So what happens, for example, when um, uh, the user, instead of downloading one page at a time, downloads multiple pages uh, with, uh, for example, multi-tab? Maybe the adversary didn't train for that case. They just trained for a clean trace, and therefore um, the, when the traffic is observed for the real user in the wild, there would be a difference with respect to the lab setting in which the adversary is just testing and training on traces that are much more similar. Similarly, there is often um, an assumption that you, already, uh, that you have a small universe of pages that the user might visit. Uh, in some of the works, they use a what is called the closed world assumption, meaning that they have 100 pages, and then they try to say, okay, if the, world of, if the user goes to one of these 100 pages, can we detect which of these 100 it is? And there, the accuracy can be actually very high, but what happens if the user is not going to any of, these, of those 100 pages? And in fact, what is the probability in the first place that the user might go to one of these pages. Can the adversary actually know that or, or not? Similarly, I mean, there are more assumptions about uh, client configuration, so the machine. Uh, you are doing basically training and testing to, um, um, to tune the attack in a lab setting with the same system, and then do you, the adversary doesn't really have control over which system the client would, would be using, which might be different in many important ways that actually alter the, the traffic traces that are then observed. There are also uh, assumptions made uh, about the adversary so that the adversary can, well, this is a bit going into what I just said, that can replicate somehow the system configuration of the user, that the adversary is able to correctly parse uh, every website so that it can identify the first packet and the last packet of a website and know that this is, you know, the, the beginning and end. In practice, this might be actually hard because it might, it's not always easy to, set, to tell when a web page has finished loading and then maybe a next page is starting to load. 
And similarly, that the, 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 the traces are clean in the sense that you can use a Tor browser not just for browsing, but maybe you have other applications that are tunneling traffic through a Tor browser, and that would also introduce uh, traffic that uh, access noise um, when you are trying to do, deploy the attack in the wild. And there are also assumptions about the web in the sense of uh, web pages have different versions uh, depending on where you uh, are accessing them from. So localization, for example, their uh, websites might have uh, personalization options. Uh, they might have uh, ads that change uh, for different users and therefore also alter the traffic uh, trace of the, of the web. And also many web pages are very dynamic, meaning that they are updated regularly, particularly websites like news sites, for example, uh, and therefore you have, the adversary has trained uh, on a certain version of a, of a web page, but what happens the day after, two days, ten days after, is it the web page it still looks the same, because if the, the, yeah, the user will visit that page at some later point in the future. So the, uh, how, you know, what is the, the, how does the adversary, what does the adversary have to do to keep this uh, database to, to up to date? What is the, the cost of that um, of keeping that database out of date. So in the methodology of the, the first part, uh, which is already the, the, published, that is, the paper that is published in, um, in CCS last year, we are basing ourselves, uh, there are many details that you have to um, sort of fix uh, in the methodology. We are based, uh, basing our work on the, the one of uh, Wang, and, Wang and Goldberg using yeah, batches with tenfold uh, cross-validation and uh, the fast Levenstein attack uh, in order, which was at the time uh, the, the most effective one, now there are more effective ones. And we perform comparative experiments. So what we want to, the question that we are trying to answer is, okay, the adversary did this um, setup of crawling websites, of building templates, and now wants to attack a user in the wild. What happens when some of the assumptions that the adversary made about how the, this user is going to browse, uh, the pages, how they are going to look like, and how the system is going to look like, what happens if the adversary gets some assumptions wrong? How does the accuracy of the attack suffer with that? So what we do is that uh, we do uh, comparative experiments. And in a way, we have like, uh, so the comparative experiment has uh, two cases. In the first case, the training and testing is being done on the same, on traces collected under the same uh, circumstances, under the same setup, okay? Uh, and in the, um, Second case, we are assuming that we now have a user in the wild uh, and the adversary is applying his lab setup to the uh, real condition that might have, that has one variable that is different. So basically in the first case, we train and test on uh, the sort of baseline uh, set of uh, parameters and this is what we call the control. And in the second case, uh, we train on the sort of adversarial setting, and then we deploy on the user setting with one variable that has changed, some value of interest. Okay, so we looked at uh, the effect of uh, some of these variables uh, being um, different in the user setting and in the sort of attack in the wild setting and in the adversary setting. One of them was, okay, what happens if the, the user is not browsing nicely one page at a time, but uh, they are, you know, using multiple tabs and maybe loading multiple pages, you know, very close to each other in a way that the adversary um, cannot, you know, clearly see this gap between one page and the next. And in fact, well, I mean, we took uh, information from some studies for Firefox. Uh, users use on average two or three tabs. Uh, so we did experiments uh, with just two tabs. Um, and, the, of course, then you have another parameter, which is what is the difference be, in time between opening one tab and the next. So we had half a second, three seconds, and, and five seconds as uh, differentials between the tabs. Uh, we call them uh, foreground and background, and uh, we have a fixed uh, foreground page, and the background we pick at random, and we keep it for the full batch. Um, and then we, we say that the adversary succeeds if they detect either of the two pages. So the adversary has trained on both pages. Now, both pages are being loaded very close to each other, overlapping to some extent, and now we want to see whether the adversary can detect one of the two or something else. If the adversary detects one of the two, then we say that the attack succeeds. Uh, so this is a quite generous um, definition of, of success for the adversary. And the experiments show that, that uh, multi-tab browsing really is very disruptive for, the, um, for web fingerprinting attacks. 
basically, uh, while the adversary would obtain a, um, an accuracy of nearly 80% in the control setting when the user is doing as he expects the user to do, once the user is doing multi-tab browsing, then the accuracy drops below 10%. And I, this is a nice result as well because the adversary has no control over this. You cannot control whether somebody is going to open a second tab while they are browsing. This is, is, is not something that is predictable or even visible to the adversary potentially. So sort of a hidden, hidden variable is very nice that just something as simple as that would disrupt the, the attack so almost completely. Uh, we could say, okay, well, you're doing sort of an unfair comparison in the sense that Okay, the adversary could also train on pairs of uh, pages and then, you know, train on that and then try to detect when you're downloading two pages at the same time in multi-tabs. But then the complexity of the attack completely explodes in the sense that you have all these combinations of two pages and then you have all these combinations of possible, uh, yeah, this time distances between open one and the next and then, you know, the database of the adversary basically explodes with, uh, with yeah, possible options. So another experiment we did was with the Tor browser version. So this is a bit less relevant now because uh, yeah, of the automatic updates that uh, Chris just spoke about. But uh, so last year there were several coexisting Tor browser versions. So one of the questions uh, we asked was, okay, what if the adversary has trained on one browser version, but then the user is actually using a different one? Would that also affect the attack? Um, and we saw that indeed, uh, in this case, uh, between two of the versions, the drop of accuracy was uh, moderate from 80% uh, to 66%, but in, the, in another case, it dropped very dramatically. So um, in this case, it was because the, the randomized pipelining uh, was different in uh, the version in, for which it drops, 2.47, and this is why you know, it, the, uh, yeah, the training becomes a lot less useful because uh, the, the way the pages are being downloaded has changed very significantly. Uh, but in any case, even if, if uh, now all users would be up to date, that also means in terms of the cost of the adversary that whenever there is a new version of the Tor browser, the adversary might have to completely redo the training and the crawling because it could be that his data set has become obsolete once users update because now the traffic is being downloaded in slightly different ways and we can see that this is very likely to induce uh, yeah, a drop in accuracy. So that's good news. So another uh, thing we wanted to, to know was about location in the network. So if I am an adversary uh, I, and I'm located in some, I have to be in some physical place, what happens, I mean, I will train from my physical location, what happens when I apply, when I try to attack a user that is accessing the network from a different location? Do my, does my database of templates still work well when you know, the user is accessing Tor from, from somewhere else. So to do this, we had three virtual machines. So one was in, in Leuven, one was in New York, and the other was in, in Singapore. Uh, and what we did was to train in one, uh, with the, the traces obtained in one location, and then test on the traces obtained in a different location. So what we found is that when we train in Leuven, and then try to apply those, uh, try to attack somebody who would be using Tor from New York, the accuracy drops very dramatically again from 66% to below 10%, okay? So if we try in, in Leuven to attack people in New York with uh, our view of the network from Leuven, we would fail miserably. So I guess it's good news for people in New York who are concerned about us. Uh, the same for Singapore, we see also a very significant drop um, when we tested uh, in um, trained in Singapore and tested in New York, the drop was less. We think that this is because the two virtual machines were hosted by the same company. Um, so it was the same company offering this service. So we think that probably the network conditions and backend system was more similar than when we compared it with the, the virtual machine in, in Leuven who had nothing to do with, uh, with the other two virtual machines. But basically, I mean, the good news here is that uh, I mean, going back a bit to the discussion on targeting and bulk, sur and, uh, bulk surveillance that was uh, in the, uh, taking place during the, the Q&A session of uh, Chris's uh, talk, is that it is actually, it becomes also difficult for the adversary to, to have, uh, to, to deploy what's a fingerprinting attacks at scale, in the sense that if you want to attack somebody in particular, you might have to train your classifier from a location that is very close to your user, 
because if you train from somewhere else in the world and then you try to apply your templates to your target user that is uh, accessing the network from another place, you might find that your classifiers are not working at all when, um, when applying the attack. So this is good news. It is, you know, you have to basically tailor very much your, your attack to the location of the user. So another experiment we did uh, was, uh, well, uh, we sort of saw, okay, you, I, I, I am the adversary. I did this scroll. I collected uh, samples for a lot of uh, web pages. Um, so how long are these web pages up to date? Because if people, if the, the, the websites that keep these pages uh, up have been updating them, maybe you know after a few days, the, the traces that I have are completely useless because when a user visits the page now, the traffic pattern is completely different. So we saw that indeed uh, the staleness, uh, the traffic becomes, the, 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 the sort of the attack database becomes obsolete very fast. After nine days, the accuracy had dropped below uh, 50%. And after three months, basically, the accuracy was, was gone uh, completely. So in this sense, the adversary needs to keep the, the to keep the, the database up to date, they will need to be con constantly crawling and constantly updating those templates, and otherwise, very quickly, it would be uh, outdated. It is worth noting that this is usually, uh, in the website fingerprinting literature, when people report uh, the results of the attacks, normally they will have, they will be comparing traces that were collected very close in time. So this is an effect that, you know, is usually not, uh, yeah, capture in, in, in results. So to summarize the, the experiments I explained uh, so far, uh, after nine days, accuracy drops uh, below 50%. Multi-tab completely um, yeah, disrupts this attack. So if you're concerned about website fingerprint, you should just do tab browsing. Um, Tor browser version also had an effect, and the network, uh, location in the network also uh, had a, quite a significant effect. I mean, we can see that Basically, what this is saying is, even though website fingerprinting attacks can be extremely can, can look extremely effective in the lab, when you're having uh, attack conditions that are very controlled, once you try to apply them in the wild, you would an adversary that tries to apply them in the wild will run into all these problems likely, and therefore their accuracy would not be quite as high as the one that is obtained reported uh, for lab experiments. So this is good news. I mean, uh, the bad news is that website fingerprinting is, is uh, attacks are possible and they, are, they can be very accurate. The good news is that uh, once we go to real conditions, um, yeah, the, the, the attack can be much less effective than, than we think. So another issue is the, the closed and open world issues. So the early works consider closed world of pages uh, that the user could browse. So basically, we have 100 pages. Uh, we train on these 100 pages. Now the user visits one of these 100 pages. Do we classify this page correctly among the 100, yes or no? Uh, now, this makes sense if you have, uh, uh, I mean, in attacks that, for example, uh, try to find the, which page within a website you're downloading, it makes sense because if, um, if, the, if a website has whatever, 100, 1,000 pages, this is a closed universe, so you can train on all of them. And when the adversary is, vis when, sorry, when the user is visiting that website, they will be downloading one of those and not something else. And therefore, you can be sure that you have the full universe. Now, in the case of Tor, you really, I mean, what is at the other side is anything, right? Uh, it could even be traffic that is not a website, so it's not even restricted to the web. So in that sense, um, having a closed world assumption, it's not very realistic in the sense that how can the adversary constrain which website the user would be browsing to? Um, so then th the question is, uh, okay, so if the user, uh, we, if, if the user uh, might be visiting something that is not in our training set, what is the likelihood that the, the a priori probability that they will be going to one of these pages we're interested in that we want to monitor and we want to attack and we want to detect in the traffic. Uh, and here the question is, okay, if the adversary has a very good estimation that I am almost sure you're going to this website and now I want to confirm it with a website fingerprinting attack, then if you have a very good prior, then you would have the, a meaningful result. 
But then if you have a very good prior, then you already have a lot of intelligence about this user. If you know which website they will be visiting, right? So it's sort of a confirmation attack. You have a suspicion, and then you can confirm it with what's a fingerprinting. Now, if you really have no idea where the user is, might be browsing, then the, the problem changes because uh, then uh, the, the fact that the accuracy, even if the, if the false positive rate of the algorithm is, is very small, once the prior of the user going to that page in the first place is very small as well, then the two of them sort of work together in a way that the adversary would be getting a lot of false positives. And most of the, po of the positives the adversary gets are actually false. So this is what is called the base rate fallacy. And I have a nice um, example in a couple of slides uh, showing how, uh, how that works. So for those of you, I mean, I guess many of you are familiar with the base rate policy, but in case you are not, this is a very nice graphic example that explains. So these uh, breathalyzer uh, tests are for detecting uh, people who drive uh, after having drunk too much alcohol. So of course, these are tests that are not perfect. Uh, so if you are drunk, you will be found 88% of the times. And if you are not drunk, you will still give a positive in 5% of the times. So we have a control, and uh, Alice is stopped, and she has to blow into this breathalyzer, and she gives a positive. And now the question is, given that she, she gave a positive, what is the probability that she's drunk, right? So what is it? Is it 95%? Is it 88%? Is it something in between? It turns out it's actually only 10%. Okay? So how, how can that be? So this is how it works. This circumference uh, is uh, the world of drivers, and each of the blue dots is a driver, okay? So now, only 1% of people are reckless enough to drink and drive, so we have there uh, eight dots. Eight people in that universe are, uh, this is the base rate of the prior, or the, this is the, the prior, only eight people would be drunk in this big set, okay? So of these eight people, 88%, will give a positive. So there's one guy who gets away there, and the others are all caught, OK? But of the blue dots, 5% will also give a positive, right? Because the, the test gives a 5% of false positives. So they are erroneously identified as drunk. So when you see that all the people who, who give a positive, which are the people in the inner circle, we see that actually most of them are not drunk. Right, even though the false, the false positive rate is only 5%. So why is this happening? Well, because the probability of being drunk in the first place is very small, and therefore most of the positives you get will be false. So in website fingerprinting, you can have a very similar example in which you have the pages that you want to really detect that the user is browsing to would be the red pages, and the blue, page, the blue uh, dots would be the web pages that are irrelevant for the adversary. Right? So in that sense, if the probability of the user going to one of these um, pages of interest, monitor pages, is very small in the first place, then the false positive rate, even if, if, even if the false positive rate is small, the total amount of false positives will be actually very big. Right? So then the attack becomes kind of useless because all these people that you think are going to the target website are actually not going there and they are just false positives. And this is particularly relevant for pages that are not so popular, right? Because the prior probability of going to that page would not be that big in the first place. So we did uh, some experiments uh, uh, in uh, website fingerprinting. So we had uh, four monitor pages that were pages of interest. We uh, trained on the top Alexa 100 pages. And then uh, we tested in the 35 top Alexa 1,000 web pages. And it was a bi binary classification, so the adversary just, w we would give the adversary a trace and say, okay, is this a monitor page, yes or no? So it's just a binary classification, not which monitor page, just one of the monitor pages. So um, the adversary wins when he correctly classifies a monitor page as a monitor page. So what about the prior probability? How, we, how do we, yeah, where do you get these prior probabilities? We, we had two test cases, so one, was, uh, let's assume the probability is uniform. So, uh, yeah, in basically there are 35,000 pages. I mean, this is obviously not correct because in Alexa, uh, I mean, the top page is the one that has more probability. But we wanted to test two cases. So let's assume 
the user is uni as we increase the size of the universe, the, the user will go equally likely to any of the pages that are in the universe. And in the second case, we took priors estimated from a, a data set that had been collected um, from real world users that were given a few hours to browse the web. They were in some tasks, but then they could also freely browse the web. And there was lots of URLs there that we could ch see, check, uh, okay, so which URLs are users going to? And we saw that um, about 25% uh, were not uh, in this Alexa ranking, and 50% only of the, only 50% of them were in the top Alexa 100. And then even then, I mean, you can have multiple pages within a website, so maybe we're not maybe necessarily going to the front page, but we we took just the yeah. So these are the results. Uh, so we have even though we have. Uh, a true positive uh, rate of uh, 0 0.8 and a false positive rate of just 2%. We see that uh, for a uniform world, obviously, the more you increase the world, the prior of going to a monitor page goes down. And as a result, the success of the attack also goes down. And it goes down to negligible values. In the case of uh, having a constant prior, even though you're increasing the size of the world, the prior going to one of these monitor pages uh, is staying constant. In that case, the accuracy was dropping to 13%. So basically, this is to say that, yeah, if the prior is not very high, then having a, a classifier that gives the correct answer 95% of the times might not be enough when you want to deploy the attack in the wild. That's the main message. We also looked at uh, algorithms that uh, try to deal with this uh, in a smarter manner by saying, okay, let's have two steps. First, we see which page it can possibly be. And then we have a second step of verification of, are we really confident enough that this is the page? Because if we are not confident enough, it could be that this is a false positive and it's just not none of the pages that we have trained for. It's something we haven't seen before. So with this, we could reduce the number of false positives, but still the rate was too high for, uh, for many of the scenarios. Another thing we looked at was the cost of the adversary. So if we want to... Um, deploy a successful, keep uh, a successful uh, fingerprinting database, what is the cost? And of course, it depends on the number of pages, not only the number of pages, but also versions of these pages, also personalized versions, localized versions, also um, uh, the pages being changed, how, how often are they updated? The attack also, the cost of the attack is also um, increasing with the number of target users because you have to do some training that is specific for the user. If you train in a different location, then your attack would be much less effective. You might want to also replicate as much as possible whatever system the user is using in terms of the computer or any other characteristics that might have an effect on the effectiveness of the attack. And then, of course, I mean, some classifiers are more expensive than others in terms of computation and complexity. The, I mean, we provide some uh, formulas in the paper. Of course, depending on these parameters, you would have one another result. But the, the conclusion is that maintaining a successful website fingerprinting attack is actually quite costly. So this is the good news. The bad news is the website fingerprinting attacks are working, and we should not dismiss them. The good news is that deploying them at scale uh, and uh, keeping them effective is actually not cheap. And I think this goes back into the yeah, bulk targeted surveillance. If surveillance is expensive, then, you know, it will not be deployed, like, just for free everywhere. So this is, this is a good thing. So just to, uh, I have a few slides. So some of our newer work is looking into defenses because the question is, okay, so if uh, as some, a lot of the work on looking at defenses against what's a fingerprinting was assuming this really perfect world for the attacker uh, in which the adversary has these ideal conditions for, for testing. Uh, but if real conditions are already harming the effectiveness of the attack, maybe we can have defenses that are not completely perfect in a theoretical sense that, you know, in the ideal world would not give you perfect protection, but maybe it's enough to add some noise to, um, in real situations, uh, drop the accuracy of the attack sufficiently. So there's, there's some um, approaches. So some of them are at the very high level, uh, at the browser level. Uh, they have been shown ineffective in... Um, prior works already. Some of them are what is called super sequence approaches or traffic morphing. So what they try to do is create anonymity sets of pages. So you try to say, okay, uh, we are going to group, uh, it's, it's a bit like the, the idea of K-anonymity. We are going to group pages so that all of them within this set 
they look like um, they look the same, basically. Or we are going to try to make one page look like another page. Now, the problem with this is that you need to have a very I mean, you'd run into the same problems as the attacker. You need to have a very broad view of who, what are these other pages, how do you find, how do you optimize uh, the amount of padding that you're using, that you're adding to make them all look the same without, you know, completely uh, exploding in, in terms of the padding that you add. So it becomes infeasible. Also, how do you transmit this information to users? How do you tell them, if I want to download a website, how do I know which is the, the set of sites that I should use for cover? And I should, it, it just is not practical. I mean, you can do it in the lab because you have all the information, but if you think of deployment, it becomes uh, infeasible. Then there are some defenses that use constant rates, and this is obviously not leaking any information from inter-packet delays, but this is very expensive. And if you want to have constant rate, you need to delay some of the user uh, real traffic in order to, because it's not the slot in which you should be sending a packet, right? So uh, increasing latency, we think, that is, is very harmful uh, for, uh, because, I mean, it, it will not be used, basically, if, um, if latency is increased. And then some, there are some uh, improvements over the constant rate uh, solution, but they are still expensive and they are still having um, usability cost. So we say that a defense to be uh, realistic for deployment in the Tor network it should be, of course, it should confound classifiers, so effective. It should not increase latency. Uh, it should not require uh, distributing to users, you know, these super large data sets of things that they need to know in order to run the defense. Um, auxiliary information. We should not uh, expect the other side of the website that we're visiting to do anything special for us for deployment of the defense. Um, because, I mean, web, web, web uh, servers could very easily thwart uh, website fingerprinting by just randomizing the responses that they give to each user, right? But then you need the web, page, the web server to actually be in helping you. Otherwise, this is not going to happen. Um, and the only thing we can do is to increase bandwidth a little bit because in the entry... We are padding basically the entry piece of the user into the Tor network, uh, and there is some spare one with there, so it is okay to add some bandwidth uh, on, that, on that link. So that's the, the, the thing we can do. So we have looked into adaptive padding. This is a proposal the, that is already from ten, almost 10 years ago from Meshmatikov. It was a proposal for defending in the, against end to end confirmation attacks. So these are attacks in which the adversary sees both ends at the same time. So this is an even more difficult attack to defend against. And uh, adaptive padding generates traffic at, at random times, and uh, it chooses the inter-arrival -arri distribution to match that of general web traffic. The nice thing about adaptive padding is that it does not introduce any latency. So whenever you have a packet, a real packet to send, you send it out, and uh, you don't delay it at all. Uh, okay, um, that's really nice. And another nice thing is that it, because of how it works, it really disturbs many of the key features that are exploded by classifiers, which are um, often um, relating to bursts, so to sort of moments in traffic when the, uh, yeah, a lot of traffic is being sent in a small uh, period of time. So yeah, but we have a, an implementation as a plug of transport, and you need to obtain this distribution of packet delays, you need to do some crawls. I mean, where do you get this uh, information on uh, how it's going to look like? So just to give you an idea on, on how it works, um, there are basically two histograms. So the, the, uh, the, the algorithm has sort of two modes, the burst mode and the gap mode. So there are these two modes because the traffic actually looks like uh, a series of bursts. So tr real traffic would be you would have a burst of traffic, then nothing is happening for a while, then another burst of traffic. So basically this irregularity of, uh, of uh, um, in order to, to deal with this irregularity, the algorithm has sort of states that are different from whether you are uh, in this piece uh, of your transmission where you are sort of sending lots of, lots of uh, packets or whether you are in a valley in which you are not sending any real packets. Okay. So the way it works is that uh, you would start when you know, transmission starts, so you go into uh, mode uh, U, which is the, the burst mode, and there you would be sampling from this distribution here, the one up, which as you can see has uh, Interpacket delays that are actually bigger than in the um, in the gap mode. Okay, so why are these bigger? Because these are uh, interpacket delays that actually represent the distance, the distribution of distances between the end of a burst 
and the beginning of the next, the next burst, okay? While in the lower distribution, which is the gap distribution, those interpacket delays are for uh, the difference between two packets within <coughs> a burst, all right? So there are these two modes. So when I mean, I mean, you, I start, I have a packet, so I start in U mode, because, okay, I have a packet, I, I might be starting a burst now, okay? So um, what I do is uh, I first take a sample out of the upper histogram, out of the upper distribution. You take a sample from there, one delay. And then you, you see what happens. Two things can happen. Either you have another packet to send, and if you have another packet to send, I will put it back, my token that I took from the histogram, so it's with replacement. Sorry, yeah, without replacement, but in this case I'm replacing it. I put it back and I take a new one, okay? And I send the real packet and I take off one of the samples from the, you know, the smaller bin. In this case would be the 64 bin, which is the first bin, okay? I take it out. Now, at some point, uh, my timeout expires. At some point, I took a sample and at some point I got to this point, right? At which I took a sample and no real packet is received and therefore uh, now I send a dummy packet, right? I send a dummy packet and I go to the next mode, which is the gap mode. And now what I'm doing is I'm sampling from this histogram and that means that I'm sending packets much faster. So what I'm creating effectively is a fake burst, okay? So I went from one mode to the next. This was, this time was sampled from the upper distribution, all right? And now the interpacket delays within this fake burst are sampled from the lower distribution. And this goes on until there is a real packet received, and then you go back to the other mode. Yeah, five minutes. Or uh, it can be that you sample from the infinity bin, which was something that we added with respect to the original design, and then you also go to the other mode. This is to stop, um, to stop the loading, so, yeah, to stop the generation of traffic, because one of the problems of any of these defenses is how do you know that the page, that the traffic finished? So what is the, the ending condition? So you, you have been sending real packets and dummy packets, and when do you know that you don't have to send any more packets, right? This is a problem. So many of the other defenses, they say, okay, we pad to a multiple of uh, whatever, power of two, and so on. So in this case, uh, it is probabilistic. It will be different every time. And it will happen whenever you sample from the infinity um, bin. You can make this bin bigger, and in that case, you stop earlier or smaller, and then it's more difficult to stop. So there were some modifications. One was this soft stopping condition. Uh, another one is control messages in the sense that now we want the, the client to be able to tell to the server uh, in order to send uh, dummy traffic that goes towards the client what the histograms look like. And there is also, um, we also added interactivity in the sense that there are two additional histograms that generate um, dummies not only when you have, it, it's not only triggered when you have a real packet to send, but it's also triggered when you receive a packet from the other end because this simulates the sort of request response um, uh, yeah, interactions in real traffic, okay? So this is also helping. So yeah, we, are, we have evaluated it with the KNN uh, uh, algorithm that was proposed by Wang and others, and we have some exper experiments. Go quickly to the comparison. So the, uh, we, we evaluated in a closed world because that, that was the way to do a fair comparison with the other systems. Uh, and for several algorithms, uh, what is important here to see is that the latency that is introduced by the other defenses ranges between 100, uh, so two and a half times slower, basically, and three times slower, which is really slowing down a lot the usage of Tor if we want to use uh, those defenses. And for adaptive padding, is zero, which is really nice. So that makes it very usable. In terms of bandwidth, uh, Tamaro, which is uh, the third defense there, is actually uh, uh, spending less bandwidth than, uh, than adaptive padding. Adaptive padding is 54% overhead in bandwidth, but it's still actually quite lower than some of the other defenses, and in terms of uh, effectiveness uh, of sort of how effective it is in confounding classifiers, it is not better than the others, but it's sort of within the same range as the others, better than some, worse than some sort of comparable uh, performance in terms of effectiveness, but without 
adding any latency and with moderate bandwidth. So we think that this is you know, a realistic defense, basically, that can be deployed, even if, yeah. Some more results. This is how the true and false positive rates uh, look like. Uh, this is when the traffic is unprotected, and once, I mean, basically, the, the di diagonal is the random guessing, so we see how adaptive padding brings the success of the adversary much closer to random guessing than uh, compared to unprotected, so that the effectiveness is actually uh, reasonable. Okay, so jumping to conclusions already. Um, the takeaway messages is that, yes, website fingerprinting attacks are effective, but uh, be mindful on in which conditions the, the lab testing has been done and whether they are replicable in real scenarios. Um, second is uh, be mindful of the effect of false positives in the sense that even if the false positive rate is not very high, when the priors are very small, then you will still have a lot of false positives at the end of the day. That this attack is not cheap. I mean, the attack doesn't, the attack, the, the good thing for the adversary is that he doesn't need to have many capabilities in terms of network visibility, because you just need to tap one point. It's not like the NSA has to watch, you know, everyone, all the cables. No, no, no. Just one point between the user and the Tor network. There are many entities that can do this. So in terms of capabilities, it's very cheap, but in terms of cost of keeping this database, this data set of templates up to date, it becomes very, very expensive. Um, and it becomes expensive to scale it to multiple users in different locations and with different systems. And uh, we think that adaptive padding is uh, a defense that is effective and or at least thwarting the attack sufficiently while not introducing a usability penalty, meaning that it's you know, reasonable to deploy it in the wild. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I have um, one little question. I think everything you did seemed to be on HTTP 1.1 or 1.0, and I'm wondering how this will change with HTTP 2.0 where I suspect that the fingerprinting might be a bit harder because there are more requests being pipelined, so you don't have as many interactions. Yeah. That means many things going back and forth. The server utilizing the TCP throughput much better, presumably, if everything the ITF has designed works. So even though this wasn't a design goal, as far as I could tell on the HTTP, mm -hmm. this discussion to reduce fingerprinting attack surface yeah. for HTTP 2.0, I think... Uh, uh, the attack itself might be less effective on HP 2.0. Can you give us an idea of how much less? No, I, I, uh, yeah, I mean, you have to do, exp I mean, of course, how much, it will depend a lot on experimental conditions, so I cannot, but, but obviously, I mean, one of the nice things about adaptive padding is that you also can tune how much bandwidth you want to spend, and of course, if, the, if other, def other mechanisms at the browser level are already lowering the accuracy, by themselves, then you can also, you know, tune the parameter for adaptive padding so that you're spending less bandwidth and still having, you know, adequate protection. So I think that's, that's one of the nice things, that you're not bound to this, um, I don't know, constant rates or things like that. It's, it's much more tunable and flexible in that sense. And you, you get a trade-off between, you know, bandwidth that you, wait, that you overhead bandwidth and security. So that's why we like it, yeah. All right, cutting it off here because there's a coffee break waiting yeah. here for us. Um, let's start again at 40, and please join me in thanking Claudia again. Thanks. Thanks.